So first of all, we use it as a source of drinking water. So let's talk about how, uh, um, how uh, we use the water for drinking on a little video clip. Turning raw sewage into drinking water doesn't sound terribly appetizing. But that's what's happening in Orange County in Southern California. Orange County faces chronic water shortages. To meet the needs of its growing population, the county spent $500 million on a state-of-the-art water treatment plant. It's the first of its kind in the United States. There's few new sources of water, and this is going to be one that's going to be key. Environmentally friendly, uh, cost competitive, and it recycles. The facility treats the sewage with advanced filtration techniques, such as reverse osmosis, where high pressure sends water molecules through ultra-fine membranes. Ultraviolet light is also used to remove contaminants. But the biggest challenges are not technological. One of the problems these type of projects has to overcome is separating the toilet from the tap. The process is state-of-the-art technology, but unless the people are willing to accept the water, all the engineering goes for naught. It's the idea of drinking water from a toilet that's not easy for everyone to swallow. To win over the public, the plant opens its doors daily for tours, visits which end, of course, with a tasting session. It's as good as any water I've ever had. This is a, a basically an example to the world on how you can recycle sewage. We have to do this. I mean, we're running out of water. We've got to do this. All right, so we use the water for drinking. Interesting thing. All right, where does our drinking water come from? We also use, unfortunately, for waste disposal. I've kind of heard of a disturbing video to watch about a river in Texas that we're going to watch here. Sadly, many rivers are used to dump waste in, so we'll see how that is not a good choice, typically. Welcome to California Connected. It was a California centennial that wasn't celebrated with the parade, a commemorative coin, or even a new postage stamp. A hundred years ago, a 1905 flood formed the New River and the Alamo River, both of which flow into this body of water behind me, the Salton Sea. Today, the New River has been called North America's most polluted. The 70 percent of it made up of waste materials and raw sewage. It's also a breeding ground for deadly diseases like polio, tuberculosis, and typhoid, most of it coming up from Mexico and dumping right here into the Salton Sea. It's filthy. It's toxic, but it's water. And as we know in California, that means people are fighting over it. Here's John Ridley. If some network ever did a reality show about America's dirtiest river, this one would be the star. The new river is extremely dirty. It's been cataloged as the most polluted river in North America. In North America, so the, the, from here to Canada. From Mexico to Canada, it. it's the, the most polluted river. We know exactly what's in the water, and you have disease-causing virus, um, typhoid, uh, polio, hepatitis, uh, what you can, whatever you can think of. It's, it's, it's in, in there it's in some in there. fashion. Exactly. It's the new river, but it's the same old story. It's pollution. And for those of you sitting at home in your air-conditioned living rooms, you don't know the half of it. Right now, it's about 109 degrees here in Calexico. The sun is high in the sky. And below me, this river is basically cooked sewage. It is one of the worst stenches I've ever been around. About 70% of the flow is made up of ag waste. It's tailwater from ag activity in Mexico. We're talking about it right here in the border. Another 20% is uh, municipal waste, wastewater, partially treated and untreated sewage and about 10 percent is uh, industrial waste increasingly. So you've got everything from uh, animal feces coming from farmland, you've got industrial waste, you've got human fecal matter. This is all going through this river and it's flowing in and around, I mean, communities, homes, families, kids. That's right. And when the regional water quality team comes to test the river water, they suit up same as if they were heading into a hot zone. Jose Angel is an executive officer of the water board. Two sets of gloves Two sets on, of gloves. face mask, face shield, and or, or glasses. That might not be protection enough. The levels of bacteria they find here are staggering. For this river, the standard is 260. 260 That's per? Correct. Per 100 milliliters per liter. And what does the new river usually come out at? It varies from the high 100,000s up to 16 million. 
between 100,000 and 16 million. That's correct. 16? Yeah, and that's because that's how much we can measure. Probably it's a little bit higher than that sometimes. And regular water that you would be bad to have contact with is 260? 260. Wow. Anything beyond that, it poses a threat uh, to public health. Wow. Sure. So if I fall in... They'll just replace you, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Next, rivers are hubs for transportation. We've used, rivers have been used for centuries to transport goods, to transport people, to transport many, many different things. So let's uh, catch that one on the clip here. They're also used to, uh, it can be turned into electricity. All right, which you're using your electricity on your iPad as you watch the podcast, aren't you? So, or whatever. So they can be turned into electricity. So let's, let me show you a clip on how we actually can turn electricity or water into electricity. One hundred and seventy thousand cubic meters of water flow past here every minute at almost sixty kilometers per hour. That's enough water to fill about a hundred thousand Olympic swimming pools every day. Standing here you can actually feel the power of the water. Harnessing that power is what hydroelectric stations have been designed to do for over a hundred years in Ontario. In essence they are factories that convert the energy of falling water into the flow of electrons or what is commonly called electricity, the electricity that powers the province. Most hydroelectric stations use either water diverted around the natural drop of a river, such as a waterfall or rapids, or a dam is built across a river to raise the water level and provide the drop needed to create a driving force. Water at the higher level is collected in the forebay. It flows through the plant intake into a pipe called a penstock, which carries it down to a turbine water wheel at the lower water level. The water pressure increases as it flows down the penstock. It is this pressure and flow that drives the turbine that is connected to the generator. Inside the generator is the rotor that is spun by the turbine. Large electromagnets are attached to the rotor located within coils of copper wire called a stator. As the generator rotor spins the magnets, a flow of electrons is created in the coils of the stator. This produces electricity that can be stepped up in voltage through the station transformers and sent across transmission lines. The falling water, having served its purpose, exits the generating station to the tail race, where it rejoins the main stream of the river to continue the cycle of creating clean, renewable energy for Ontario. And then lastly, I just have some short video clips of how we recreate on the rivers. Um, many of you have probably just played at rivers. People build houses alongside the rivers because they love the recreation opportunities of a river. So, um, yeah, let's lock, uh, watch this podcast or this video clip on that. Well, folks, that concludes today's podcast. Hopefully you've learned a lot about drainage basins and about um, watersheds and drainage divides. And then realize that we here in Woodland Park live at a very unique and special place. Um, from the river perspective, we are on the border between two huge drainage basins. Well, that concludes this chapter. We're done with it. And hopefully you will learn well and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye. See you. Ta-ta.